Good morning, and welcome to St. Peter's United Church of Christ in Skokie's Sunday morning YouTube worship service. Thank you for joining us again today. We are recording worship a little differently today. Out of an abundance of caution, Beth and Pastor found out on Saturday morning that someone they were with last Sunday tested positive for COVID-19. They were in an outdoor event and everyone was practicing safety precautions. So we believe that Pastor and Beth will be fine. However, until they are able to test negative for COVID, we intend to practice what we preach and put everyone's safety first. Thank you for understanding. I have just a few brief announcements before we begin today's worship service. We will be having communion this morning. If you haven't already set yourself up with bread and wine or juice, please do so. When pastor invites us to take and eat and drink, we will share the sacrament together. We will be having a fundraising event with 10,000 villages in Evanston this year. It will be a little different than our normal one. On November 19th at 6 p.m., we'll kick off the fundraiser with a one-hour live Zoom presentation um, at 10,000 Villages after they close in Evanston. Then, shopping will begin online and is open for 48 hours. There is more information in your November announcer and watch for details in the coming weeks. There are other items in your bulletin as well, including the final due date for your wreath orders, information about poinsettias this year, and our next Village End Pizza fundraiser. Please take a few moments to read those announcements. But for now, let us continue with our worship. I want to thank Jen Schneider for her announcement pertaining to uh, Beth and I and uh, COVID. Uh, I don't want to repeat what she said, but I do want to thank her for making that announcement and uh, you know, wearing a mask, which is what all of us were doing that Sunday afternoon. Um, there may have been moments when a mask was removed by a speaker. Um, my memory of that's a little foggy, but all the same it is, as an act of love, best to be cautious during a pandemic. And so we're doing it this way. And uh, Beth and I both plan to be tested in the very near future. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, says the Lord. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to you and eat with you and you with me. Let us hear Christ knocking. Let us open the door of faith. Let us welcome him in and sup with him. Let us worship God. pretense among us as we address our thoughts to our God. You and I may fool ourselves or one another, but God knows us as we really are. All that we try to hide from ourselves or others comes to light before the one who knows and searches our hearts. Wanting to unburden ourselves, let us confess our sins responsively in our prayer of confession. Let us pray. Gracious God, help us to be honest with ourselves, with one another, and with you. 
we have searched for life amid temporary attractions. We have sought excitement in places that turned out to be desert wastelands. We have burdened others with our mistakes. To quote a psalm, we have placed our trust in princes rather than in you. We have entertained a judgmentalism in our spirits and words and made comparisons to look better than those around us. We have devoted too little time to thanking and to praising you, the source of all things. Open us now, O oh God, to the word we need to hear from you. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. The saying is sure. If we have died with him, we will live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. In Jesus Christ, crucified and risen, God's love forgives our sins and washes away unrighteousness. The Spirit comes to transform and enable us to seek our joy and our desires in the will of God our Savior. In response, may those tuned in right now join me in saying, Thanks be to God. Amen. Words about the offering and making offerings. Here are some more words for the last time for a bit, written for dedicating offerings by Reverend Suzelle Lynch. May they inspire us and uplift us in our generosity and in our hopes for the destination of our offerings. With gratitude, we receive these gifts and dedicate them to our shared work, serving human wholeness and welcoming the stranger, caring for our planet and upholding religious freedom, walking together always with love and compassion. As a congregation, we offer respect and caring to all who seek hope and wholeness. We search for meaning with freedom and responsibility. As we live our faith through compassion and action. We dedicate these gifts freely given and gratefully received to our shared work, shaping a better world for all. May every gift be gratefully received as a symbol of the many ways our life energy helps sustain this congregation and spread its vision and its values far beyond its walls. May these gifts, given with generosity and love, help our church and our world become more peaceful, caring, free, and fair. These are words from prayers of dedication, which can help us think more about what our offerings mean and what they can do. So be it. Our service continues now with our prayer for illumination and the scriptures from the lectionary read by Molly Uchtman. Last week was Reformation Sunday. Then we remember the Protestant reformers emphasized three things. Faith, God's grace, and the centrality of the scriptures. It is okay if a week later, or any time, we can see, even see that in the order of worship. The sermon, where God's word is opened up, is at the center, or middle part, of our service. Please join me in prayer as we ask the Holy Spirit to open up the word to us now, as well as during the sermon. Let us pray. Calm us now, God, into a quietness that heals and listens. Open hearts that hurt to the balm of your word. Speak to us through it in clear tones, so that we might feel our spirits leap with hope and act with faith as your resurrection witnesses. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our first reading is from the book of Joshua, chapter 3, 
verses 7 through 17. Our Hebrew scriptures so far have taken us to the death of Moses. Now, the new leader Joshua directs them in crossing the Jordan River into the Promised Land. The Lord said to Joshua, This day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, so that they may know that I will be with you as I was with Moses. You are the one who shall command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant. When you come to the edge of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. Joshua then said to the Israelites, Draw near and hear the words of the Lord your God, Joshua said. By this you shall know that among you is the living God, who without fail will drive out from before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, Perizzites, Girgashites, Amorites, and Jebusites. The Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth is going to pass before you into the Jordan. So now select twelve men from among the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. When the soles of the feet of the priests who bear the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, rests in the waters of the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan flowing from above shall be cut off. They shall stand still in a single heap. When the people set out from their tents to cross over the Jordan, the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant were in front of the people. Now the Jordan overflows all its banks through the time of the harvest. So when those who bore the Ark had come to the Jordan, and the feet of the priests bearing the Ark were dipped in the edge of the water, the waters flowing from above stood still, rising up in a single heap far off at Adam, the city that is beside Zarathon, while those flowing towards the Sea of Arabah, the Dead Sea, were wholly cut off. Then the people crossed over opposite Jericho, while all Israel were crossing over on dry ground. The priests who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan, until the entire nation finished crossing over the Jordan. This ends the reading from Joshua. Our next reading is Matthew 23, verses 1 through 12. Jesus begins advising his disciples and the crowds on the scribes and Pharisees. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the scribes and Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Therefore, do what they teach you and follow it. But do not do as they do, for they do not practice what they teach. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on the shoulders of others. But they themselves are unwilling to lift a finger to move them. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. They love to have a place of honor at banquets and the best seats in the synagogues and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces, and to have people call them rabbi. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all students. And call no one your father on earth, for you have one father, the one in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant. All who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. Here ends the reading from Matthew and our scriptures for today's service. May God give us wise and faith-filled understanding of this, the word of God, of this, the word of God, for the people of God.
It's a big Sunday. I believe every Sunday is a big one, since it's the weekly celebration of the resurrection of Christ. This Sunday is big, because in addition to celebrating the Lord's Supper, there are a lot of things going on. As people of light, informed by the scriptures and the Holy Spirit, theology and community, and nourished by the bread and cup, what clarity of vision might we have? to bring to what's going on. Well, there were a lot of things going on in our first reading. Molly told the story of the crossing by the proto-Israelites over the Jordan, through the Jordan, into the Promised Land. It's a story of a people undergoing transitions. Think about it. What do you think are some of the transitions that were happening. One change is geographical. The people, after 40 years of wandering in the desert east of Jordan, were moving across the Jordan into Canaan land to stay, to make a home, to set up tribal lands and villages, and get established in this land that's flowing with milk and honey. They're moving in that's the first and obvious transition. Another change is in leadership. Moses has died after 40 years of leading them, and both he and the Lord appointed Joshua the new leader. I will be with you as I was with Moses, Yahweh told Joshua. Now Joshua had become Moses' protege, but all the same, there's a new boss, other than the Lord. In a, you know, the next, that's a transition for the people. Then there is a generational transition. Other than Joshua and Caleb, it's safe to presume that a whole bunch of those crossing over were born during the desert travels. Forty years have passed. Being enslaved was part of their heritage, but maybe not their experience unless it was internalized. Because as someone once told me, you can take the slaves out of Egypt, but that does not mean you have taken Egypt out of the slaves and former slaves, and maybe their descendants. And that's a whole other topic. These people are transitioning, too, from being in a relatively safe, wandering modality, needing to be defensive from time to time, to now having to be aggressive, even on a warpath, to take this land from the Canaanites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, etc., and make it theirs. That's a shift in focus and a sense of purpose. Lastly, it's a shift into a new milieu, partly a cultural milieu, not only to becoming aggressive, but being in a new place with new religions around you, and discovering how to get along between each other when they'll be in villages and in tribes and, and broken up. The Israelites will ultimately go their separate ways into their tribal lands. They've been in a big group all this time, a cultural milieu that will be brand new, part of the transition. Well, crossing the Jordan involved and represented a lot of transitions. The homily is titled The Crossing Jordan 2020 because, you guessed it, we are going through a lot of changes too. Some of them are church related, such as how we've worshipped via the internet since mid-March due to COVID. It's also affected how we hold meetings. We transitioned as well from a full-time pastorate to three-quarter time, and our first full year with Ben as our music director. Changes in leadership, as well as other things, largely due to COVID, but not totally. This has also affected how we could do the rummage sale, and the events and gatherings that <clears throat> were held with precautionary measures taken, or that were canceled for safety's sake transition. 
COVID has forced not only our church and churches into transitions, but our society. There have been generational changes going on and generational changes happening. The killing of George Floyd along with Breonna Taylor and so many others almost accumulating into this summer, that really flipped the switch for a lot of white folks to being willing to openly discuss systemic racism, the benefits of whiteness, and related areas of police interactions, health care, voting rights, and access, white supremacist movements, and much more. That is a transition for this country which I hope is far from finished, if it is ever, really. I hope our people remain engaged for a transformation to equal justice under the law for all. Another transition coming upon us is the elections. This is the last Sunday before Election Day. Whether there is a change in leadership in Washington and elsewhere or not, transitions are coming. There may be violence, which also pushes our national identity out of its comfort zone. There may be civil disobedience, which is more in our comfort zone as Americans and as followers of Jesus Christ. I'm not ordained to predict outcomes, but I was ordained to preach the kingdom of God, as declared in the law, the prophets, and revealed and embodied by our crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ. Whenever we undergo transitions, it is imperative that the church be guided by the values of God's realm. We heard just last Sunday that loving the Lord our God with all our hearts, with all our souls, and with all our minds, and loving our neighbor as ourselves are the two greatest commandments. And all the other ones hang on those. They depend on those. If you do those, the rest will follow suit and fall into place and happen. In my November announcer piece, I said that we love our neighbors as ourselves by how we vote and by the fact that we vote. Now as we cross Jordans of 2020, our love of God and neighbor, in addition to other Kingdom of God values that flow from that, they are to be manifest in how we live in these transitions, whatever comes. A few things about this as we contemplate Crossing Jordans 2020. Here's the first. Remember the priests. Remember the priests. They carried the Ark of the Covenant which held the tablets of the Ten Commandments. Their feet went into the water of the river Jordan first. Then the people crossed over. They were there for that holding the ark. After that, but not in our text, Joshua commanded twelve stones to be placed in the river as a marker to what had happened, and only after that did the priests, still carrying the ark, leave the river and come to the people. The priests, in a way, represent the presence of God. They led the way in but waited for all to pass over safely, they brought up the rear. It reminds me in, of this passage in Revelation when the Lord said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. The priests, the presence of God among the people, bookended the transition across the river and were part of it. They were, or God was, and is, always present through God's servants, God's people, and the free Holy Spirit. Whenever you and I, America, or St. Peter's United Church of Christ in Skokie undergo change, which is usually scary, nobody leaves the warm circle of the familiar without pain, never forget God is present. The transitions may well be sanctified. God is at work. Here's another. 
In Matthew 23, Jesus pointed out the hypocrisy of the scribes and the Pharisees. Quote, they sit on Moses' seat, therefore do whatever they teach you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they teach. He goes on to describe how they are cruel and how they burden others with details of law and custom while neither helping them nor doing the same unto themselves. And here's the killer verse. They do all their deeds in order to be seen by others. All their deeds to get attention and maintain their status in the eyes of the people. Where's God? Where's love for the neighbor or for the poor? Cotton Patch Gospel renders that all they do is for show. Frederick Bruner translates, They live their whole lives in order to be noticed by other people, pointing out that the Greek to be seen can also be understood to make theater, and Jesus condemned theatrical living, living to be seen by others, in the Sermon on the Mount. Bruner adds, Jesus does not deny that they lived for God, but he asserts that even their life for God has as its final purpose others' esteem, their real God. By comparison, by blessed comparison, Jesus teaches the kingdom of God value of service for others without care for a title or a status. There is to be no status among servants because, quote, the greatest among you will be your servant. All who exalt themselves will be humbled. And all who humble themselves will be exalted. It sounds like Jesus knew something about the times we're living in today. He called a spade a spade when calling out the hypo hypocritical scribes and Pharisees. They're in it for themselves, for what you think of them, for exaltation and acclaim. Jesus says, not to be so among you, don't do what they do. We are not to give our lives in service to our egos being assuaged we, or assuaged. We do not exist, and Jesus did not get crucified and raised again so that all we his people do is for show. No, all we do is for the reign of God, R-E-I-G-N, the reign of God, the kingdom of God. In this passage, that's mutual service and modesty. It's a warning that Christians not fall into the traps of the scribes and Pharisees, but keep our egos in check with God up front. This is how we carry ourselves in transitions. Mutual service and humility do not exclude prophetic action when called for. It occurs to me that actions on behalf of justice are communal actions grounded in love for God and God's values, love for our neighbor, and they are deeds of service. They bear witness, but it is not about us. It's about the realm and the values of God. They always belong, maybe especially in times of transition where there is so much change going on, and it is easier to draw on this when we recall the priests in their Jordan crossover. So in transitions brought about by COVID or the upcoming elections, remember the priests, emblems of the presence of God, present at the original Jordan crossing. In our Jordan crossings 2020, let us also draw not only on that memory become present reality of God, but also on the teaching of Jesus. God is not in those who do it all for show, even if, perhaps it's especially if, it's religious show. God is not served by phonies, but by people 
who serve each other, and who choose service over status out of love for God and love for neighbor. Keep the values of God in how you and I treat others imperfect as we are. Loving service can lead the faithful to de-escalate with angry persons carrying guns and releasing profanity. It can bring those who are able to acts of peaceful resistance against injustice, theft, and cruelty. The greatest among us will be our servants out of love for us and for kingdom values. Lastly, something that transcends transitions is Holy Communion. As the priests upheld the ark which contains some of the manna from the wilderness, so do modern day ministers offer the bread of the earth and the fruit of the vine. It is bread for the journey. It is the meal of mercy which helps us to be merciful. It is the feast of forgiveness, enabling our ability to forgive and reconcile. By the active grace of God, that it is that body broken and blood shed which stayed not long in the tomb but was raised in triumph over all that would crucify the truth and the love of God. We need this spiritual union to help us keep on the straight and narrow of agape love, courage, endurance, faith, and hope. So let's also bring our bread and cup to our Jordan crossovers of 2020. We'll need it. Amen. As we shift into our time of silent and pastoral and silent prayers, I've been asked to include Barb Bailey, who had a uh, fall at home, uh, missed a step going downstairs, uh, badly sprained her ankle, and... Uh, other parts of her body are hurting too. Um, I did get an update on Josephine, excuse me, Jasmine So, uh, Christine Carnati Svensson's uh, godmother. She's doing much better and is home. Um, please join me in the spirit of prayer. Here we are, O oh Lord present before your mystery, and part of your history, grateful for all your blessings. We give thanks for your presence in good times and in bad, in sickness and in health, in stability and in transitions. Consecrate us, we pray, so that you are as pleased with our lives as we are grateful for your love. Speaking of love, we ask your favor to shine on Maria and Randy and Jen and Rich as they celebrate their wedding anniversaries this week. May your spirit also bring blessing to Donna and Brian on their birthdays. We ask your face to radiate upon Paula and Angela and all who are expecting and all who prepare to unite in marriage. As your priests stood in the Jordan bearing witness to your presence, may you also be present, healing spirit, with all those in need of your touch, including June Peterson, Judy Page, Bar Bailey, Jim Sampson, Across the Pond, Robert Jernberg, Bill and Alice, Wes, Bruce, Eva, Hillary, Eric, Sarah, Tim Taylor with COVID, Jaina Bramchik, and her friend Gwen, Marlene, Jasmine, 
and others. Guide the fingers of surgeons, the minds of technicians. Hold up the compassionate hearts of nurses and all of those in the hospitals pushing back on COVID and those who assist them the ways they do. Sanctify chemo and radiation treatments, physical therapies, loved ones, chaplains, and pharmacists. For those living with mental health challenges, grant them what and who they need. Help those working to be free of addiction and lift up those weary in depression or great fatigue. As we pray for your spirit to come by there, we also bring before you those who grieve. So many have died from the virus but others from other afflictions and behaviors and choices and mistakes and other losses. Lord, here they are. We lift them into your hands. We pray for our families and loved ones. for neighbors and co-workers, for fellow students, teachers, and those seeking good jobs. Watch over our women and men serving overseas, military, and civilian, and may they return healthy and safe when they're done. We pray for peace. We pray for softened hearts and changed minds in those claiming white supremacy, those financing and carrying out acts of terror anywhere, those who use their power to suppress the righteous vote or muddy the integrity of our elections. We pray for this election and its processes, that they be free of all which you despise and judge. We pray that outcomes will be pleasing in your sight, bringing human agents responsive to kingdom values of compassion, sacrifice, service, justice, and honesty. We pray for peace, not only now, not only Tuesday, but also for nights and days to follow. We pray in silence two in this blessed time. All these, O oh God, we offer up in the name of Christ Jesus, our host at the upcoming banquet. In his name we offer up these prayers. Amen.
Come to this sacred table, not because you must, but because you may. Come, not because you are fulfilled, but because in your emptiness you stand in need of God's mercy and assurance. Come not to express an opinion, but to seek a presence and to pray for the Spirit. Come to this table then, brothers and sisters, as you are. It is said, it is spread for you and me, where you are as well as where I am. It is spread for you and me that we might know again that God has come to us and shared our common lot and invited us to join the people of God's new age. St. Luke the Evangelist records that on the evening of the first day of the week, the same day on which our Lord Jesus was raised from the dead, he was at table with two of his disciples whose eyes had not yet been opened to perceive who he was. And he took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. People come from the east and the west, the north and the south, and gather about the table of our Lord. And it is the table of our Lord. It's not St. Peter's table or the United Church of Christ's table or the Protestant Church's table, where we are gathered in the name of the Spirit, in the name of Christ. We're at the Lord's table. It is Christ who invites us. He is the host and the feast itself. Let us lift up our hearts. Let us pray. Holy God, our loving Creator, close to us as breathing and distant as the farthest star, we thank you for your constant love for all that you have made. We thank you for all that sustains life, for all people of faith in every generation who have given themselves to your will, and especially for Jesus Christ, whom you have sent from your own being as our Savior. We praise you for Christ's birth, life, teachings and example, death and resurrection, and for the calling forth of your church for its mission in the world gifted by the presence of your Holy Spirit. We offer ourselves to you as we unite our voices and our souls with the entire family of your faithful people everywhere. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Bless this bread and bless this fruit of the vine. Bless all of us in our eating and drinking at the table that our eyes may be opened, and that we may recognize the risen Christ in our midst, in each other, and in all for whom Christ died. And wherever we are, please end the prayer which we make in Jesus' name by saying, Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And after he had given thanks for it and blessed, Barukata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Hamotzi Lecha Min HaAretz He broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, also, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the cup of the new covenant in my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And Paul the Apostle adds, As often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. 
ministering to you in his name, I invite you to partake of the bread and the cup. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven, broken for you, risen for you, taken. blood of Christ, the cup of the new covenant, the cup of the gospel, poured out for you. Let us, in remembrance of him and in celebration of his presence in our midst, take and drink. Please join me in the spirit of prayer. And when you hear me, lead us into the Lord's Prayer. We'll pray that aloud together. God of all times and places, God who sees us through transitions, changes, we humbly ask that you, as we believe you will, see us through this year, and this part of the year that remains of transition. Not repeating requests from the pastoral prayer. We do pray that your spirit uphold your church, that we may be people of light, communities of light, where shadows threaten and violence is really at the cusp. We pray for you to use us to protect and bless and bear witness. We give you thanks for feeding us at your table and for calling us to be your faithful people and for enabling us to be your faithful people, to the best of our ability and under the power of the Spirit. All this we offer up in the name of Jesus, who told his disciples they may pray like this, and so we also pray using his words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. And now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you to bear all things, believe all things, hope all things, endure all things, with faith, with hope, and above all, with love. Amen.